Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Over the years, this great privilege I've had to host this program, uh, I've had wonderful opportunity to interview many, many people, uh, some who uh, were never the least bit open to the Catholic Church, but by the mercy of the Holy Spirit, their hearts were opened, uh, sometimes kicking and screaming, but then they discovered the beauty of it. And others of my guests were brought up Catholic and then left for a variety of reasons, and then uh, often they, they know something's missing and then they come home. Our guest tonight, Carlos Zamora, is what we would call a revert, for want of a better term. And uh, what I'm excited about is Carlos uh, is very much involved in a music that I'm not very involved in, but I'm anxious to learn more about. So what a great privilege, Carlos, to have you. Thank you for having on me, Marcus. the journey home. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. It is it's great. And you came up from Texas, right? From Texas. I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay. I've been there pretty much my whole life. Um, I did move away for short periods um, in high school, and then shortly after my wife and I were married, we... We're in Mexico for a short period of time. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, let me back out of the way and invite you. Let's hear your spiritual. Let's start you way back. And way back. Where you came from spiritually. Well, I, I am a cradle Catholic. I was born and raised Catholic. Um, I was born, I'm, I'm a little bit older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 1977 in Fort Worth, okay. uh, Texas. Uh, both my parents were Catholic. My mom was actually very devout Catholic. <laughs> and my dad... Um, I don't want to say he wasn't devout, because he he did believe, and he, and he one thing that he did do is make sure that we went to church with our mother, <laughs> even though he didn't necessarily a, attend with us. But he made sure we went. He made sure we went to our CCD classes and stuff like that. So um, I'm so, not sure why he didn't join you know, us. So that's kind of a guy thing. I'm not, you know, it's not a thing for men. It's for I'm not sure what it was. I, I can only yeah. speculate. I think. Um, I think he might have been going through some some struggles at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Just you know various things. Um, yeah. But you know, I think the thing about it with us is we kind of fell into a, a what I think what a lot of Catholics fall into is it started becoming become going through the motions. Yeah. We kind of went to church, may or may not have listened to the homily, may or may not have realized what was going on you know, at the consecration or any of those things and. Um, even in CCD, you know, I, I remember going to the classes. I don't remember what was taught to me. I just, you know, it was kind of just going through the motions, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I, I kind of fell away, I think, at an early age. Not, not fell away, but I became very nominal, I guess you could say, right? It was just, just going through the motions. I was going because I had to go. My dad was forcing us to go with our mom, and, and my mom went us there, so we were there. You know, I, uh, I was not a, a, a cradle Catholic by any means. But I was thinking, yeah, as you said, a lot of cats can fall into this groove. You, you go through the hoops. But it mm -hmm. seemed to me that you can, you can fake it by going to mass or going through these classes and all that. But going to confession, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you can stand in line and be faking it, mm -hmm. you know. But once the doors close and you're sitting in there, I yeah. suppose you can fake it. But you had to say something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, what was your experience of confession as a young man? Well, to be honest with you, I went to confession prior to my reversion to the faith. I probably went to confession three times in my entire life. And my reversion came later in life. I was already 30, 31 years old at the time. Right. So I, I went to confession before my first com communion because we had to. Yeah. Um, when my wife and I were married, I went to confession because the priest told us we needed to go to confession. Didn't really, I wasn't really a heartfelt confession, beyond, to be honest, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, um, you know, that was probably, that was probably the only two times, actually. Two now them, yeah. About, yeah, and then my, my next con confession, I feel sorry for the priest that had to hear it, because I, I felt like I was there forever. <laughs> it felt like three hours, because it was my, re my reversion confession. And that was uh, yeah. around the time that I was like 30 years old. But, you know, but back, again, as a young child, you know, it was just another part of the rite of passage in the yeah, church and didn't yeah. mean much for you. Didn't mean much for me. I mean, um, I wasn't opposed to it. I just didn't know much uh, enough yeah. about it to really appreciate it or value it. Um, you know, growing up, though, at the time when I was growing up um, in Fort Worth, Fort Worth uh, and Dallas both have, have kind of, you know, historically had higher than average crime rates and, and murder rates and things of that nature. And for a period of time when I was in middle school and high school, um, 
Fort Worth had the highest overall murder and crime rate per capita in the nation. Whoa. And so um, where I was, it was very, very, very easy to kind of get involved with, you know, gangs and, and drugs and those types of things. So that's um, and not so much that I went looking for that, but a lot of the guys I grew up with got involved in that. And we were friends, so it was kind of natural to kind of get involved with it. And yeah. So we uh, um, got involved in that at a real early age, at a yeah. real early age, uh, you know, middle school, high school, and doing things we weren't supposed to be doing. And, you know, I don't want to get into all the gory details, you know, but I can, you can probably imagine, you know, um, we did a lot of crazy things. And it, not, not something we're proud of, but it's the reality of what we, right. what we did growing up. Uh, and it was about the money. It was about the maybe the prestige, about the power. But it, it, maybe the effects it had on those other people's lives didn't cross your mind very much. No, you know, yeah, you're right. Um, I think a part, at least for me, part of it was um, I was a small guy. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm still not you know, not a big guy. You know. And, and uh, there was a period of time where I got picked on, you know, by guys in the neighborhood, guys in the area. Yeah. And, and uh, when I started getting involved, you know, and started fighting back and started getting involved in these, in these gangs and these things, people stopped messing with me. Hmm. And it just felt like it gave you some power. It gave you some yeah. type of a, um, yeah. a way to fight back, right? Yeah. And so that was kind of, for me, that's what it was. And then the more you get involved with it, the more you have to keep improve, keep proving yourself, hmm. you know, um, and that was even even with the, with the music I started doing, you know, when I guess for lack of a better word, when I started doing hip hop music, it was more along the lines of gangster rap music. How'd that start? Um, well, when I was in high, I, I've always loved hip hop music. That's just my thing. It was yeah. just I remember back in third grade, the very first hip hop album I heard was was a group called Run DMC, and uh, my brother came home with a tape, a cassette tape. Let me hear it, and I was like, man, I was sold. I was sold, I loved hip hop music. From that time going forward, I started writing my own little lyrics. <laughs> and uh, in middle school and high school, we'd have these rap battles, I guess, you know, where you kind of battle one, hip -hop one another. hip-hop and rap very uh, well, a hip -hop similar is genre? More, I think hip-hop is, um, is more of the culture. Rap is one part of the culture. Right. So you have the, like, the break dance, and you have the graffiti, you have the, the rap. So hip hop is more of the culture, rap is more of the music. Okay. Yeah. And so we'd have these these rap battles. We'd have these these, you know, we would rap at house parties or, or raves or, you know, things like that. We just but it wasn't really something I was taking serious. Like it was it was fun and it was cool. But um I I had gotten involved in, in selling, you know, selling some drugs, selling, you know, some dope and things like that. Um and so that was kind of where my money was coming from. Right, and the music wasn't making me money, so I was like, "This is fun, but this is making me money." Yeah. And so I, I kind of got involved doing that a little further. And um, after high school, I actually got into some some, some trouble in high school, um, and I I ended up my my parents had me go live with one of my aunts down in South Texas to kind of get away from some of the issues I was involved with um, and um, seeing I was right along the border so Laredo's on the border of Mexico and the United States and so you you see down there there's a we have a tendency to kind of blame Mexico for this, for this drug trade yeah. but being there firsthand and being involved in that type of thing there's a criminal element there from the United States and there's a criminal element there from Mexico they're both there and there's it takes two to tango oh. right and I realized real quickly, I was like, well, um, I would see some of the horror stories that we hear about on the news yeah. that we never really see. I saw some of those things happen firsthand, you know, just um, um, maybe not, you know, in person, but like I was right there a couple miles away from where it happened. Yeah. And so you realize how real it is. And that kind of scared me out of doing mm -hmm. what I was doing because uh, I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be held responsible you know, for those, you know, having that blood on my hands, you know. Or to be a statistic yourself. Or to be a statistic myself, yeah. So when I came back from Laredo after high school, I tried to kind of get away from that. And my kind of my escape was was doing music. That was kind of my escape. And at, at, at the time, this was 
mid nineties, late nineties. Um, that was the, the hip hop music, the, what was prevalent in hip hop music was gangster rap. That was the, the prevalent thing. It wasn't, um, the more nowadays is maybe not as much gangster rap involved at that time. That was, was, was prevalent. So that's what we kind of got involved with. Wow. And, um, You're st still going to church once in a while on the side during uh, that time? Yes. Yes and no. Uh, I, I did go, you know, in fact, I actually, um, it was kind of a, over a period of time, I kind of felt myself getting further and further away from the church. Yeah. Um, prior to going to Laredo, if I, you know, take a step back a little yeah. bit, um, like I said, I was in, had gotten into some trouble and, um, my youth group, we would meet at, at the youth group's house, at the youth leader's house, and they asked me to stop coming to the youth group um, because they felt like I would put some of the other kids in danger of being there. Mm. Um, and at the time, you know, looking back, I, I can kind of see the perspective looking back at it. At the time, I felt like they were discriminating against me, like they just didn't like me, they didn't want me there. I, I, I was really hurt by it. Yeah. I wouldn't have had, had admitted it that back then, but, you know, thinking back, I was hurt. I was really hurt and I felt like, you know, they just didn't want me to be there. And so I kind of felt myself getting further away from the church already at that time. Yeah. yeah. And so. Um, and I suppose if, if your understanding of church was just the externals walking in the hoop with no depth to it, then with all this stuff going on, I mean, why? Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because you do. If, if, because a lot of the way that uh, our, you know, Protestant brothers and sisters, they think, you know, they say, if, as long as you love Jesus, it doesn't matter what church you go to. You know, and, and I remember hearing people say that, and it made sense at the time. So I, it, I kind of felt like, well, it doesn't really matter if I go to a Catholic church or if I go to any other church, right? Yeah. And so uh, I didn't go to any other church necessarily at the time, but I didn't. I stopped going to the Catholic church. Oh, I kind of found myself falling away. Our guest is Carlos Zamora. So, uh, but at this point, it sounds like you said you're starting to lean now towards music. I was, yeah, I started kind of getting more involved in music. Um, in fact, at the time, there were not a lot of, of Latino rappers. Um, and so I, I found myself hanging around with a lot of the African-American rap groups in the area. And I was the only Mexican kid there <laughs> rapping. So we'd go around to these different clubs, different, you know, open mics and rap battles in different clubs uh, throughout the state, so in Texas, I mean, Austin, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth. And, um, but again, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't making money, it wasn't paying bills, it wasn't doing anything like that, it was fun. <laughs> and and at that point in time, I met my wife. And uh, um, I actually, you know, credit my wife a, a great deal for my reversion to the faith because she kept me grounded. <laughs> and, um, but at the time, I didn't want to be this guy that she had to worry about, you know, going out there, getting involved in whatever we were doing and having to wonder if I was coming home hmm. or if I was going to, you know, get into some sort of trouble. Because the reality is that I realized shortly, that, um, shortly after I, I started doing the hip hop music that I was living kind of the same sort of life, lifestyle, just in a different venue. Hmm. I wasn't necessarily in the streets as much but I was still doing those things at, at clubs or at bars or at, and we were involved. There was fights breaking out. There was things going on at these clubs and these bars. And, and like I said, I, you always have to prove yourself. So at that time, you know, when, uh, you know, gang violence was a little more prevalent, if you were out at a, at a club in Los Angeles or Chicago or, you know, places like that, and you'd say that you were this persona, you better be ready to prove that, that, that that's you who you are. That you portrayed in, 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 yeah. in, your, in your words of your song. Exactly. Wow. Then okay. you have to be prepared to, to prove that that's what you are. And, and that would be the case many times. Hmm. Um, which is partially which kind of led me back to my faith because I was like, man, I shouldn't have to be going out there and worried about my life because I'm out doing music that's, that's supporting my family. You know? And... Um, you know what gets me, Carlos, is that there are a lot of guys that I'm sure that you were doing all of this with that didn't have these thoughts that you're having. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like grace mm -hmm. was touching you all along. Oh, yeah. It was awakening your conscience to yeah. to this kind of a life. Is this where he, you want to be? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, 
in, in retrospect, I think that grace was always there. Um, I never had a problem believing in God. That was kind of, I think that's kind of a grace in, a, in and yeah, of itself. Right. I always knew God was real. I never really questioned that he was real. But, you know, due to some of the things that I had been through as, you know, growing up, um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the things that I'd seen growing up, I, I questioned whether or not God loved me. Hmm. And that was my struggle. And, and I imagine there's a lot of people that might be going through the same thing. Yeah. It's not that they don't believe in God. They just don't know what to believe about God. And they question whether or not he truly loves them. Hmm. You know, and, I, and I tell that to people. I say, we, we, we get in the habit of telling people God loves you. But it's very rare that we turn the finger around and say, God loves me. Hmm. And, and it wasn't until I, I kind of had a, I like to call it my come to Jesus moment, that I really realized how much God loved me. <laughs> and that's, in fact, I think that's what really brought me back to church, when I really realized how, how much he loved me and how much his church um, was there to bring me back to him. You said your wife had a lot to do with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my wife had a lot to do with it. I tell people all the time, um, my wife's faith is, is strong, much stronger than mine. Um, I had to get, you know, I, when I was having my, my journey back to the faith, I had to download all these apologetics materials and, you know, free college courses I'd find, anything I could find, get my hands on, I'd, you know, reading books. And I had to fill my mind with that to be able to make my journey back, right? And my wife didn't need that. My wife's faith was just strong as can be the whole time. And we used to bump heads, you know, when I, um, I guess I should say, you know, when, when I first had my experience of coming back to the faith, I actually consider myself to have left the Catholic Church. Right. I didn't come directly back to the I was Catholic say, Church. Yeah, and that's a big part of your dream. You need to make sure we don't skip that because oh, really, yeah. you had this awakening. Yeah, yeah. It was actually at, at, a, at a concert, okay. at so a gangster you, rap concert. So by this, so you're doing gangster rap, and you're fairly successful at it, right? We were. We were. Um, we were. Um, we had sold independently uh, a little over 100,000 copies of, of our records and whatnot. And wow. we had done some, some touring, opened some shows for a lot of major... Uh, you know, platinum selling hip hop artists, uh, major groups. You know, we had even you know done some collaboration work with some of the or, of the guys that we looked up to growing up. You know, guys who were hip hop icons. You know, um, and but it just wasn't fulfilling as much as I thought it was gonna be. It wasn't. It was just I was just I still felt empty and I didn't know what it was. Um, and it's it was actually at a at a concert. Uh, a friend of mine, and I'm still friends with him to the day. To this day, we still talk regularly. Um, he had asked us to come perform at a, what he called an all ages event. He said, there's going to be 1,500 people. It's all ages. And I wasn't sure what all ages meant. Okay, man, you know, pay me. We'll be there. <laughs> come to find out all ages is just another word. It's, it's the cool way of saying a teenage event. So oh. you get there, or while we got there, and there were 1,500 people, but they were all middle school and high school aged kids. Oh. And I'm in my mind, I was just, I was kind of disgusted. I was like, wow, we don't have anything better to say to these kids than, you know, all this filth that's in our lyrics, you know, mm -hmm. all this profanity and all this, you know, the violence and stuff we were rapping about. And, and I just, I felt really disgusted, mostly with myself, mm -hmm. right? And, and I told him, <laughs> I remember clearly, I said, did you really book a bunch of gangster rappers to perform for kids? That's crazy. And I told him, you should be ashamed of yourself. And he looked right back at me and just really just matter of fact, just said, I'm not the one rapping it. You should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and that just hit me like a ton of bricks. It was just, it was just like, I'm not even mad, you know, that that's probably the realest thing I've heard. That you you're absolutely right. I should be ashamed of myself, and uh, I I probably was laughed at for a long period of time after that, because we had a little VIP section that was section off for the artists, and and I remember walking back to the area and I ducked my head in shame on the table, and I sat there and I cried, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what it was. It just I just couldn't stop, and I and that was the the night that I, mm -hmm. you know, just dedicated my life to God. I was like God, I, I don't know what you're calling me to or where are you leading me to but I know this is you and I know this is you trying to get me out of something and so I, I quit doing that type of music at that time that was the last time that we did something like that and um, 
Uh, I didn't know. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, did your music then transition to a different topic level or what? Uh, yes, it did. Um, not immediately. It okay. took me some time to kind of figure out what I was going to do because at, the point, at that point in time, music was my only stream of income. Hmm. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, what am I going to do now? I can't rap about this stuff. I can't make money off this. I don't need that blood on my hands, you know? And um, so I was like, well, I'm going to transition into doing Christian rap. And, um, you know, in fact, if I go back just a little further, yep. so my dad and I, you know, I, I want to be real careful how I talk about my dad. I don't want to make, paint him in a negative light or in any way, but we, we didn't really uh, see eye to eye on a lot of things. And he was never thrilled about the idea of me doing rap music, oh. to say the least. That may be an understatement. <laughs> we might be like me. I don't understand it either, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, and we might just a negative view rather than giving it a exactly. chance. Exactly. You know? And so there was a point in time where, um, you know, he had said some things about my music, and I, I wasn't happy about it. And, and, I, and I, was, I was like, Dad, why can't you just be happy for me? And I just told him, I was like, you know, I've got all this going on. I'm doing these events. I'm doing stuff with these artists. I'm, I'm you know, selling these records. I'm doing, I'm making a living, you know. And, and, I, and I told him, I, I still remember the words I said. I said, I feel like God is just placing everything where it needs to be, you know, giving me all these things. And my dad said real clearly to me, he said, those things are not coming from God. God doesn't put those types of things in your life. God may have given you the talent that you have, and you're not being a good steward of it. And I was just like, I was floored. <laughs> I was floored. And it was like, I couldn't argue with that. I was because I knew he was right. Yeah. And it, it was that was really only a couple of weeks. Thinking back about it, it was really only a couple of weeks before that before that concert. Wow. So I think my dad was the one that kind of set that. Planted the seed there. Planted the seed. And, and ironically, it was my dad that wasn't as active in the faith growing up, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, I think it's, it's really telling about how important the role of a father is in, the, in, yeah. in our lives and whatnot. So um, that's really interesting. So um, after I, you know, started doing this music, I said I was going to do Christian rap. I realized I don't really know anything about my faith. So I started kind of, you know, knocking on doors, talking to different people. It's like, we have a tendency to kind of think, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with the church or, you know, so I, I started talking to you know, a lot of uh, Protestant, you know, evangelical, non-denominational people who kind of got into my head with a lot of, you know, very anti-Catholic ideology, ideas and and you know, and, and I think they meant well. I don't want to, you know, mm -hmm. look like I'm I'm knocking them in any way. I'm not, but they they planted those very anti-Catholic seeds in my mind, and so um, I started attending. You know, well, I, I really never really pan, you know, like found a home. I kind of was church hopping the whole time. I spent a period of about two and a half, three years, where I was just kind of church hopping, and uh, I don't think I really ever considered any of those denominations or even the non-denominational churches to be home I was just kind of trying to find where I where I belonged and um, it was you know in doing the, the Christian rap music you know I because I, I kind of pride myself on saying things from my life experience you know when I was rapping about gangster rap and you know those types of things I had that lived experience and I could write about that all day and then you know and when I found out I couldn't really write about my Catholic or about my Christian faith I was like well I got to I gotta get this experience. Right. So I, I started, you know, getting involved with with you know these churches, doing events with them, and and then I would catch myself saying things that I would hear them say, and I realize that that doesn't quite sit well with me. There's something wrong with mm. that, you know. And I would challenge myself to see why it didn't feel right. Mm. You know. So that was your observe. We're gonna take a break a bit, but I want to hit you for the break. I want to ask you a question because rap is a is a genre of music that. Uh, frankly, I don't understand a lot about, but you know, my background, I've been a musician all my life, and a big part of that is folk music or rock, folk rock from mm -hmm. the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And when you're a folk singer, generally when you're singing, you're not writing a song, you're, you're repeating words that you've learned. So you could sing that song whether you believed in it or not. You know, it was a James mm -hmm. Taylor song or a, a whatever. Uh, but it seems to me when I hear rap, especially when you said you had kind of rap battles, that you're being very spontaneous. A lot of times. Yeah. A lot, very spontaneous, uh, you know, quick rhymes, very rapid. 
Mm -hmm. And my thinking is that for you to write that, especially if it's spontaneous, it's got to come out of in here. Definitely. So if you're if you're singing and writing about uh, gangster rap, it's in here. Exactly. So when you when you switch to Christian, you've got to change what's in here if you're going to have any lyrics come out. Exactly. I mean that's what you you're really talking about. Not just oh I'm, I'll put these songs aside. Let me get another box of songs to sing. This is deeper. It's deeper in rap deeper. music. Yes, yes, and it's you know it's got to come from a place. It's, it's real to you. It's got a, and like I said, it comes from a lived experience. That's what's, what's beautiful about hip hop to me. Is yeah. It's all about the, your experience, your life experience. Um, and it's about being very genuine too. You know, uh, the, the cool thing with, with hip hop music is it gives you a chance to kind of be very outspoken mm-hmm. as opposed to some other genres of music. Hip hop is supposed to be outspoken. It's supposed <laughs> to be kind of in your face. <laughs> and so, um, that's that's what I did. I filled my heart with that. And that's what fascinates me. You, you, when you have this conversion that I can't be telling this stuff to these kids anymore. Exactly. That was not merely I got to change which songs I'm singing. It's here because mm-hmm. this is where it's coming out of. Yeah. But you can't just change overnight. Okay, now I'm going to sing this music because I got to reinvent what's going on inside of me mm-hmm. so that what comes out of that is at this point is Christian. It is Christian rap. You're not Catholic yet, but at least you're. And what you're saying is that. What you're learning about your Christian faith is not exactly what you learned growing up, you know. Yeah. So we're going to pause there, though, because I want to jump right back into that when we come back after the break. And I do want to mention uh, to the audience that Carlos's story, his conversion story interview, is on our website. So if you'd like to hear the read the whole story or other stories like Carlos, please go to the website chnetwork.org, and you can find the details of Carlos's story. All right, we'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Carlos Zamora, uh, a revert to the church, and we paused you in your, in your story mm-hmm. where now you're, you've had an awakening to you don't want to do this gangster rap anymore, and you and you're but you're moving into Christian rap, mm-hmm. yeah, which means kind of a if you will, uh, a revamping of your whole insides to understand y- your Christian background, right? Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I like I said, I just I like to be very sure of what I say when I when I say a lyric, you know, I want to be sure that that's what I really mean, that's what I really want to say. So, I, like I said, I would find myself kind of saying things that I heard other Christian rappers say, or I might have heard a pastor say. They, I didn't know why they didn't sit well with me, but something didn't sit well with, hmm. with me about it. Uh, just for example, you know, I would hear the, you know, the term, you know, faith alone. And in my studies, and I think probably many people have said on your show, the only place I ever found the phrase faith alone in the Bible was in James, where he says we're not justified by faith alone. <laughs> And it didn't sit well with me, and I was just like, so I would, I would find myself kind of challenging my own thoughts or my own thinking. And, um, you know, over time, you know, I was, I was challenged more and more to kind of get, you know, dig deeper in trying to, you know, incre- improve myself with my lyrics. Yeah. And, and I was challenged by somebody, that, and I don't even remember who it was to, now, but I was challenged by someone to read The, the Church Fathers. And I was like, okay. Uh, I don't know why. I'm saying people are probably not thinking that most rap singers are yeah. reading all this stuff, but but the truth is that behind it, you're yeah. doing all this research. You'd be surprised about how how intelligent and how articulate a lot of rap artists are. Yeah. I mean, even on the secular side, even they, they might not portray themselves in that light, but I mean, it, it takes some intelligence to be able to put together a, a body of work yeah. with that many lyrics and that much content. It takes intelligence. And, and so a lot of those guys are very interested in that type of stuff. I like to tell people, uh, not only did I have a conversion back to my, or a reversion back to my faith, but I kind of converted into a nerd. <laughs> so, yeah, I started just studying the fathers, and it's kind of the usual suspects, you know, you know the Polycarps and the Ignatius of Antioch and, the, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas and Justin Martyr and Ambrose, those, those people, right? Um, and then I remember... Specifically, there was a pastor that I that I I used to go to his church on Sundays, and and he told me one day 
the Catholics believed that Jesus was, in, you know, was truly in the Eucharist, in the, in the, in the wafer. He said, you know, Catholics worship this wafer. And why do you want to go? Like, why would you even want to be part of that? And, and I don't remember ever learning that growing up. So I was like, I don't remember growing, learning that. Yeah, are you sure you, that's what they believe? He's like, I'm positive. They believe that that becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And so in my, I guess in my arrogance, you know, I, I said, I'm going to prove them wrong. I, I said, I'm going to go study this and I'm going to try to prove this wrong. And I only, you know, ended up proving myself to myself that it was true. Um, you know, the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And that, you know, at that, at that moment, I still had a lot of questions in my mind. And in fact, one of my biggest, you know, um, obstacles, you know, was, you know, Marian doctrines and things like that, which I still hadn't settled. But I knew that if that was Jesus in the Eucharist, I was like, how can I, how can I say no to Jesus? You know, how can I be like, I know that's you at the altar. I know that's you in the Eucharist, but I like the way this pastor preaches. Or I like the, way the band at this church, or I like whatever the case is, right? And so I was like, I can't just say that I love Jesus and to continue to walk away from him in the Eucharist. And um, that's when I realized, I said, well, how do I, what do I need to do to get back in, you know, in my Catholic faith? And, and I realized that I was just really one good confession away from that. <laughs> and then, you know, back to what we were talking about with the confession, this was the first time I had ever given a heartfelt confession. I went to confession and, and I was there with that priest and I actually made an appointment with him. I didn't go actually during the actual confession hours. I made an appointment with him, and uh, and I was real thankful that he took the time to you know, meet with me. And it was probably like on a, on a late evening on a weekday sometime, and and I, I was there with him for probably a, a good hour, hour and a half, just talking, and and uh, I mean, I just I felt like I was there forever. <laughs> but it was it was you know I was glad that I did because I was I knew I was back home, you know, and I still had some things to sort out, the marrying doctrines you know, things like that. But those all kind of fell into place over time. Um, but I, it's, it's ironic, you know, that I, I, I credit my, my, uh, my longing to be authentic in my music with making me come back to my faith. You know, I kind of credit, I kind of credit hip hop music with bringing me back to my faith <laughs> in a sense. You, you had gone from uh, being successful in secular rap. Mm-hmm. When you became Christian, yeah, did that affect your your career in essence? Yes and no. Uh, I like I said, it was my only income at the time. Yeah. So I had to find find a way to make income. I had to get back to getting a regular job, things like that. So I didn't have as much time to dedicate to the music. Um, some of the the people that listened to my old music were a lot more supportive than I would have anticipated. Mm. So that I was still being asked to come out and perform at, at events, at a secular events. And I would say, you know, I'm doing Christian rap. Yeah, that's cool. Come out and do the Christian rap. And in fact, I, last weekend I did a, a secular event in Dallas with some, with some guys that were um, in the scene where, that I was in, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, and they're just supportive of what I do. Wow. So that was really cool. Um, also... I'm trying to see how to word this here, but like um, I kind of developed a, a little bit of a fan base, a little bit of a following. I hate to say the word fan base; it sounds kind of, but for lack of a better term, right? Um, in, within the you know Christian rap music, but when I started calling it Catholic rap, I wasn't sure how they were going to you know take that because I, and the reason I started calling it Catholic rap was because every time I said Christian rap, people would assume I was not Catholic. They would assume I was Protestant, because the reality is there's a there's a, a huge Christian rap scene. Mm. And there's very little Catholic representation on there, mm. very very little, and and so I really wanted to distinguish ourselves, and and I and I told myself you know, I know that if I say Catholic that that's Christian, yeah, you know even if other people don't know that so I'm I'm gonna really distinguish myself by saying Catholic rap, and surprisingly, you know, and I, I did have some, some pushback for some people, but the majority of people were very supportive of that, even on the Protestant side. Good. Very I supportive. I was wondering whether that had... had yeah, uh, and I, I still get invited to go to Protestant events regularly. And, I, and, and uh, in, in fact, probably the last 
two or three events that I've done have been at Protestant events, and they know how, how Catholic I am. When you're writing uh, lyrics for Catholic rap, um, how, how does your Catholic faith affect the lyrics? Is it from a topical standpoint or the way morality is portrayed? You know what I'm saying? What, what, I think it's a little bit of, what is expressed in Catholic rap music? It's a little bit of, of, of all of that. Um, because that's what's so beautiful about the Catholic faith. It's, it transcends every part of our lives. Yeah. You know, the way we, we treat one another. The way we we work in our in our professional lives, or the way we do our, our personal finances, you know, any every every aspect of our lives is is affected by our Catholic faith. So we kind of like approach every topic from just from the perspective of, of a faithful Catholic, of a person that's trying to live out their faith. So um, some of our songs are are very you know distinctly and very very outright Catholic. You know, they might we might be rapping about. I have a song, uh, Matt Swain, who's also involved with the show, um, um, likes a song. It's called O oh Maria. It's from the Found Nation album that we have out. I call it, um, I call it the opening act. And I challenged myself. I said, How? I only had 12 lines to rap on that song because it was a group of us. And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the four Marian doctrines, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, more, more dogmas in one verse and see if I can do it. And, and I did. And I was like, well, who, who else puts, you know, the dogmas, the Mary dogmas in a song, in, in a rap song? It's, it's crazy. Anyway, the, the, some of the songs might deal with a little bit more with social issues, um, you know, particular, in particular issues that we face yeah. um, in, in our communities, you know, the Latino and, and African-American communities, uh, whether it be, you know, you know, facing discrimination or facing police brutality, things like that. Or, um, and then some of the songs are not, you know, distinctly Catholic per se, the kind of more generally, you know, Christian, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, we can make a song about our, our families, about our wives and our children, where, you know, it's not necessarily, right. you know, distinctly Catholic. Well, there's so many things that we share with our brothers and sisters. We talk about our Lord Jesus, you know, or the yeah. Holy Spirit, or, of course. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Now, your, your stage name, C26, C26. Right? C is there's C2. a story behind that? Well, you know, it's it's... It's not much of a story, but so when I started doing music, um, I wanted to a name that would kind of suit me. And every name that I would come up with as a stage name, I'd maybe run, run it through Google or something like that. And, <laughs> and I'd find there'd be 10,000 other guys with that same name. I was like, man, what, I got I to gotta find a name that, that fits me and nobody else is going to have. And my initials, that's too too common, too easy. But then I was like, well, you know, the letter C stands for Carlos, and I was like, the letter Z for my last name is the 26th letter of the alphabet. <laughs> so I say, I'll say C26. So in essence, it's my initials, but it's also a name that's going to be unique that nobody else is going to ever have. So if you Google C26, I'm the only guy you're going to find. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, nowadays, if you Google me, it's going to be, you know, you're going to find something that's going to hopefully lead you back to the faith, or at least maybe... Uh, help you grow in your faith. You know, Matt and I were sitting there wondering, what's, what's the source? We couldn't remember. And uh, Matt thought, well, maybe it's from Colossians 2.6. And we looked up and Colossians 2.6 is, as therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him. Amen. I mean, it's a great, that's, that's a great, you know, the way we received him by grace, that's the way we're called to live. Yeah. And in essence, I was thinking, yeah, that kind of fits because that's what you want to communicate in your music. What we've received, this is the way we're called to live it out. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, yeah, living out the faith through music is, is, I think, you know, what my calling is. It's just, you know, there's a lot of guys that do a lot of work, you know, um, in evangelizing and reaching out to the youth. Um, but I feel like, in particular, my group and I, um, we're called to kind of reach out to the more uh, marginalized youth, whether you know it be the you know the, the urban kids, the minorities, the kids that may be dealing with uh, some of the issues we grew up with, you know, drugs, gangs, prison, you know, those types of things. And so the, the group of guys that I work with, a foundation is the name of our group. We, that's kind of where we have a, a really strong um, devotion to working with those particular types of youth. In fact, uh, 
we um, are part of a ministry um, called El Padrecito Ministries, El Padrecito, uh, which is Father Maceo Gonzalez. He's a Franciscan priest in, in, uh, in California, Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And um, that's kind of his passion as well. So when I made my transition from doing, you know, just labeling Christian hip hop to doing Catholic hip hop, there was another struggle there because it was something that was kind of unheard of. There were some guys that were doing it already. There was a, a group called, well, not a group, but there was a, a label, a record label called Fat Mass at the time. <laughs> and they had some stuff out. And, um, but it wasn't necessarily the same type of music. It was a little bit, uh, it wasn't maybe as gritty or as, <laughs> as but, uh, so when we started coming out, there wasn't a lot of guys doing what we were doing. So we had to kind of build everything from scratch. It was like we were starting our own genre in a sense. Um, and I, I don't want to say we were, because I, I kind of credit the first Catholic rappers to being Fat Mass and Father Stan Fortuna and Father Pontifex, people like that. They were doing it before we were. But I think we kind of built our own lane, and we, we started doing that. And uh, I had reached out to Father Maceo, because I was just trying to find guys who were doing what I was doing. He was doing these, this rap as a priest in, in California, and it was he was reaching out to the same type of people that I wanted to reach. So we... I reached out to him, and he got involved with what we were doing as Foundation. And there's, there's five of us in the group of Foundation, five rappers. So we're a big group. Um, jokingly, we sometimes say we're the Catholic new kids on the block. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's kind of funny. But, it, you know, he's invested his time, his money, his, his resources into what we do. And, and it's opened a lot of doors for us because I think it helps people to take us more seriously because we do have spiritual direction. Yeah. Now, through Father Marcel, we do have a, a ministry that is that we're being held accountable by. It was what we say and what we do. St. Paul said, I've become all things to all people that I might save some. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I remember back in the 70s when, when I did a little bit of contemporary Christian music. Part of the reason was that we're, we're, we figured this music might reach people who listen to that kind of music otherwise. Yeah. And so they're listening to this kind of music, but through this music, you can get the message in. I'm assuming that's the reason for Christian rap and Catholic, Catholic Christian rap. Yeah. You know, I think we, we all have gifts. We all have gifts, and whether or not we're a good or a bad steward is, is what we got to kind of, you know, yeah. deal with. And, and um, I think there's sometimes people think that what we're doing is is using hip hop as, as kind of a ploy to kind of lure the unsuspecting listener into, <laughs> into the faith. And that's not what we're doing at all. Right. You know, we were hip hop artists prior to our conversions or our reversions. And we're, we're just using the gifts, we're just rededicating the gifts that God gave us and using them in, in a different way. And that's why we kind of have a, have a tagline that says authentic Catholic hip hop, because it's, it's authentic. It's, you know, as yeah. far as the art form goes, it's authentic. It's, it's pure hip hop. It's real hip hop music, yeah. but it's very orthodox. It's as Catholic as as can be. You know, we, you know, very overtly Catholic sometimes. You know, and and so that's why we have kind of have that tagline. And I think even if you're not necessarily Catholic, or even if you're not necessarily of the faith, maybe you're not even of the faith. I think that we can appreciate stuff that's real, that's genuine, that's yeah. coming from the heart, even if we don't agree with it. Well, I think one expression of, of how that your work and, and your gifts and your music was recognized is that you, you got a pretty major invitation once. A couple of times. Right. A couple of times. Talk about that. We're World Youth Day, right? World Youth Day, yes. Um, 2013 was the first World Youth Day that we, we were part of. This is uh, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Wow. And um, we had never been to a World Youth Day, so I, I, I didn't know what to expect. And at the time, Pope Francis had, had recently become Pope, and it was close to his, his, his home of Argentina. And so there was 4.5 million people at the World Youth Day throughout the week, you know, that yeah. we were there. And it was mind-blowing to see so many Catholics and so many people from throughout the world. I mean, if you think of a country, we, we met people from there. I mean, we met people from Afghanistan, from Antarctica. From, you know, all over the world, and and it was it was it was crazy because a lot of people knew our lyrics, they knew our music from all these different parts of the world, 
And it was really kind of eye-opening that we need to re keep reminding ourselves that people are watching what we're doing. They're seeing what we're doing. So we have to be really careful about how we, how we act in public or how, what we do or what we say. And that was really, really interesting. And we had a, about four concerts during that, uh, that, that week there in, in, in Rio. And um, I, was, I had to be real careful not to get them on my high horse because it was, it was just such a great experience. And, and I think God humbled me uh, at, at our big performance because the three of the performances were smaller venues. And then we had a, a big performance at a big venue that got rained out pretty much. When we got there, huh. it was pouring rain and nobody wanted to be out in the rain. And it pretty much, we, we performed in front of just a handful of people, basically. And I was, you know, it kind of humbled me and reminded me that, you know, we're, we're not here to, for stage time. You know, we're not here. Yeah, God has given us this platform to use our gifts, you know, but we have to remember why we're using the gifts. What's the intent behind it, you know? And it's not for self-gain. It's not for fame. It's not for anything like that. And so that was really interesting. And then later on, you know, um, we weren't able to make it to Poland for, for the World Youth Day in Poland. Um, but 2019, earlier this year, we were invited to come to Panama for the World Youth Day wow. in Panama City. Um, and this time, we did have a, a couple of, of bigger, you know, um, opportunities on, on, as far as stage time is concerned. So opening night, we were at the opening ceremony uh, performing in front of 250,000 people, which is by far the largest crowd I had done up to that moment. <laughs> And I was like, this was, it was, it was mind blowing. It was a lot of people. It was nerve wracking, but you know, I had to keep reminding myself we're here and it's not by accident. So some, you know, God wants us to be here. Let's, let's do what he's calling us to do. And then later on um, that week, we were at a youth prison um, that Pope Francis also visited. Wow. So we, the, the, the day prior to his visit, we were with the same youth at the same youth prison doing some, some, um, some music and some talks and got to eat lunch with the, with the youth and hang out with them. And um, those youth prisons are tougher than our youth prisons, I say that much. Wow. They've got some, some pretty tough conditions in there. And um, the following day, you know, that was kind of an anticipation of Pope Francis' visit. So that was really, really interesting. And then the, the final night, of the World Youth Day, uh, Pope Francis had a vigil, uh, a prayer vigil, and we were one of the, the groups that was per, uh, selected to perform after the prayer vigil. So we were on that, that big stage with Pope Francis during the prayer vigil, maybe about 20 feet away from him or so, and then we performed that evening in front of over 600,000 people. And it was, just, it was just insane to think about, you know. And, to this day, we still get people that kind of reach out to us. Hey, I saw your World Youth Day. That was really cool. You touched my, you touched me, you know, and it, it helped me in my faith journey. So it's really rewarding. You, you never know how yeah. God can open a door for you if you're willing to say, "Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do." Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. We've also had some. Uh, the last two of the the, the NCYC, the National Youth, Co is it National Catholic Youth Conference, right. the NCYC in Indianapolis. Uh, we've been at the last two of those events as well. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's really rewarding because, you know, you get out there and you, it never fails. You meet somebody who's struggling in their journey, or you can kind of be helpful in, in their, yeah. in their, their journey. That just, <laughs> it reminds me of C26, C26, as therefore you receive Christ Jesus, so live in him. Yeah. And it, God touches us by grace but our response is free. Mm -hmm. And I think back on your own journey that you were having that gangster rap thing and you just, Grace was saying no. Yeah. And you responded. Yeah. And look what God's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's powerful. That is really powerful. I've got an email I want to go to. Clarissa from Atlanta says, what advice would Carlos give to someone who wants to know how to balance a deep love of music while not losing his faith? My son has amazing talent is considering making it a career path, but I'm concerned about it because become an all-consuming passion and his faith taking a back burner or that it might lead him away from God altogether? Um, that's a good question. 
because there's, it is hard sometimes to, to, have to find that balance. But uh, I think, you know, my advice, just speaking from my own experience, is, you know, figure out, you have to, you have to draw some lines. You have to really draw lines and say, this is where I kind of draw the line on what I will do and what I won't do. Find out what's pleasing to God and, and keep it within those boundaries. Yeah. yeah, it's an attitude of gratitude, yeah. right? In other words, you're grateful that everything you have, it came from Him. And if yeah. you have that attitude, then even you realize the opportunities you have are from Him. Exactly. Everything. You're standing in front of, what, 16.2 bazillion people, you know, <laughs> and that's a gift of God. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, just being there, um, I was listening to a, a an episode of, of Catholic Answers at one time, and, and I remember... Um, one of the hosts, well, you know, I listened to a lot of a lot of Catholic radio, a lot of EWTN. EWTN was very, very um, instrumental in my faith journey. In my, you know, back. You even program. watch this program once. Your right? program, yeah, I mean, more than <laughs> once. I, I watched it probably two or three times a week during my during my reversion. Um, and in particular, there was a, a time where I, I heard a question from an, a caller. And they asked about whether or not we could pray to saints that were not canonized yet, and and the the answer was was well, somebody has to because they have to consider uh, you know whether or not they had a miracle that was attributed to their their intercession. And it dawned on me, and I was like, so I I, I prayed about the whole World Youth Day thing to uh, Pope John Paul II, who had not been canonized at the time. And <laughs> and within a couple of weeks, we got the invitation to the World Youth Day. And I was like, man, that's pretty cool. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly right. Yeah, the own uh, right now, you know, Fulton Sheen and, and John Henry Cardinal Newman are, yeah. uh, but it's only because miracles have been attributed to the intercession. Yeah, from the result of people praying. For them. Definitely, you know, um, the, there was a, a program called the Sunrise Morning Show, right? That Matt Swain was a part of. Yep. And I, I was I was telling him in, in a discussion we had that. I listened to that program every day on my way to work when I was going through my my reversion. It was it was an everyday thing, and I'm just you know so so thankful for the ministry you guys do for the ministry that EW10 does ministry that all these different programs because like I said earlier you really never know who's who's watching. Yeah, yeah. It's like in your music when you you found that the people all around the world were listening to your music you had no idea. Exactly. And so makes us want to be responsible for what we do with our music, with our lives, because we don't know who's watching, exactly. who's listening. We've got an email, another one, Marjorie from Texas. I live in a heavily Hispanic area, and I'm saddened when I see so many young people abandoning their Catholic upbringing. They're often lured by enthusiastic evangelicals and say that they are now encountering Jesus for the first time. How can the Catholic Church be better about ministering to people from Hispanic background, giving them a dynamic encounter with our Lord? You know, um, I think that, that we have to take into consideration that, you know, um, different people are faced with different circumstances and right. wherever they're coming from. And I think we just got to have to really um, try to put ourselves in their shoes and, you know, be relatable, come talk to people. You don't have to necessarily understand somebody's struggle, but when you can actually, when they can actually sense that you really care about the struggle, that's mm -hmm. important. So, you know, we want to be just be real careful not to to marginalize people, because I think that's the kind of the biggest turnoff in some of the Hispanic communities or the African American communities. Is they feel sometimes like they're marginalized, and I think if they just want to feel embraced, and I think that's the biggest thing is just to make people feel embraced. You know, I look, I listen to your journey, Carlos, and you talk about your Catholic upbringing, and maybe it was just all externals, but when you look back. There were an awful lot of seeds planted way back when. Your there baptism were. and your confirmation and mm -hmm. all of that was was yeah. there waiting to blossom again yeah. later in life. Definitely. And in fact, even when I was doing, you know, the gangster rap music, there were always little hints of, of faith in there. You know, I'd say things in my lyrics that were little hints of faith. And, and you know, I, I was never at a point where I just despised the faith or anything like that. I was... Yeah. I was always mindful, and I, even in the back of my heart, and back of my mind, I always thought and knew that what I was doing was wrong. I always felt, you know, a certain level of guilt about what I was doing. So it wasn't like it was, it wasn't as big of a jump as it, maybe it sounds like. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably the case with a lot of people. It maybe not as big of a jump as it seems because, again, I think a lot of people believe in God. 
even if they're not yeah. living that life. There's that struggle, that voice, and then over time they just push that voice yeah. back and back until they don't hear it. And you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you back, Carlos, because we run out of time. I'd love to uh, be here. More about your stuff. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for the having program me. And for your work that you're doing and your service to our Lord Jesus. Praise God and to his church. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your journey with us. And thank you for joining us. I do pray that Carlos's journey is an encouragement to you and uh, encourage you again to go to chnetwork.org to find out more about Carlos's journey as well as others that they've been drawn home to the church. God bless. See you again next week.